Hello everyone, welcome to the podcast. I'm gonna start it in just a moment. Thank you so much for watching the video. If you're watching by uh, YouTube, <laughs> Rumble, or inside the actual article that I'm gonna share with you in just a few moments, thank you so much. If you're on YouTube or Rumble, uh, please uh, subscribe to our channel there. And if you don't mind, give a, a comment. I would love to uh, hear about it from you. And of course, share, share these videos with as many people as you can. By the way, to explain this shirt that I'm wearing, uh, it was given to me by a precious friend. Her name is Hortense Tatsiana. Uh, she came from Cameroon many years ago. She is a, a believer. She loves Jesus. And by the way, uh, she also translates our articles into French. We have a number of articles on our website in the French language. And so you can go under the language button on our read page and you can see our languages. And one of those is French and Hortense is the one uh, that translates them. But she gave me this Cameroon shirt a number of years ago and I treasure it and of course treasure her more. Hortense, by the way, if you happen to be watching this video, thank you so much for this shirt. I, I love it a lot and I'm very grateful for your generosity. All right, let me get into this article. Again, thank you so much for those who are listening, uh, watching my video. I'm very grateful for you. Authentic health initiatives require both body and soul transformation. Perhaps you read my article, listened to the podcast, or watched the previous video. It is titled, Let's Talk About Losing Weight. Practically speaking, and if you have not read, watched, or listened to that resource, I would encourage you to do so because it would be quite beneficial and it creates a, a tandem. It, it creates uh, two resources that are very helpful on this, this problem that many of us struggle with, and that is our weight. And in that particular article, I wrote about a crucial worldview on body and health perspectives, a comprehensive approach to losing weight that is the secret sauce because behavioral modification might provide you with quick visual results. But if, if we don't change our hearts, those external transformations will revert to our old patterns of living. And since I have discussed the soul aspects in that article, what I want to do in this one is I want to touch on a few practical steps that complement that soul work that I talked about in the last article podcast video. Hello everyone, this is Rick Thomas. You're listening to Life Over Coffee. I'm so glad that you are here. I am doing a, a tandem resource here on weight loss so that I, what I hope that you'll have is really a good foundational start on how to think about something and to proceed forward on well, it is something that, that most of us struggle with. The statistics are in, and, and we are an unhealthy nation. And I, I think that also applies to most all first world countries. And so if you want to read, watch, or listen to this article, you're welcome to do that. The title of it is A Practical Three-Step Plan to Lose Weight. And so what I'm going to do in this podcast is I'm going to walk through those three steps. But first, I really do want you to hear this. I am not suggesting something that Lucia and I do. And I'm going to talk about what Lucia and I have been doing for a while now. This is our plan. It is not yours. And so you have to distinguish between the articles. There is a way of doing something and there is the way this is not the gospel. The gospel is the way. But most things in our lives are a way, and this is our way. It's just a way, and it might not work for you. Each person must seek the Lord, must seek trusted friends, must seek their medical community to figure out what best suits them in their journey to present their bodies as a testimony to the radicality of the gospel in their lives. And so when I post articles on social media about health loss with a distinct perspective on, uh, on repentance, they rarely get any traction. I've been doing this for a long time, and whenever there are certain things that if you put on social media, 
They just don't seem to go anywhere. And this is one of them. Now, I think that, you know, most health-related content that folks rave about is the ones that suggest diets and tips and tricks and best practices and smart food choices and changes of bad habits. Those are the things that create traction. And you will notice that all of those things have something to do with our behaviors. Now, I am not throwing those things under the bus. I am not knocking those things because they can help. But you rarely see programs that discuss the underlying causes for why the person is unhealthy or overweight in the first place. Now, this is critical. Now, I know we don't want to talk about it, and I understand why, and I'll explain in just a few moments. But what I'm talking about here is repentance, the underlying issues that create the behavioral problems. And though those websites and those gurus and those uh, newbies who are trying to start a, a own business or, or whatever, they, they, they spend most of their time talking about tips, tricks, best practices, eating well, and those behavioral on the surface issues. Again, great ideas, but... That is not really what we need to hear primarily because all of it begins in our heart. And I'm speaking of repentance, that unspoken non sequitur that we won't connect to the deeper and even more challenging struggle. Of course, you throw in the fact that health-related problems are too personal. Body problems fit better in the pantheon of unmentionables like religion and politics, things we don't talk about in polite society. Even though we know that the formerly treasured polite society, well, that left the station a few decades ago, though too many of us still don't want to talk about what is obviously wrong with us. Many of us are just too big. And I know why I don't like talking about it. Let's have a little confession here. My hesitancy about weight loss and healthy eating and exercise is because I don't want to share my sin list with you. Not just you in the public domain, unnamed faces and people that I don't know, but what I'm really talking about is people who are close to me. I don't want to have that personal conversation. The underlying matters that create the bigger, more visible matters, talking about those hidden idolatries that create the more bigger, visible matters. And though I want to live my life in integrity, and I really do, before people and before the Lord, it is tempting to draw back and hide parts of my life from the community in which I live. The irony is, as well as the deception is that I cannot conceal my physicality from anyone. And so I want to talk about this one-step plan, and, and this is step one. And again, this is what Lucia and I did. It is a way, not the way. Please have that fixed in your mind. In Luke 15, 17, the prodigal son said, but when he came to himself, when he came to his senses, praise God, and when he came to himself, a lot of dramatic change began to happen in his life. A few years ago, Lucia and I began a process of repenting of the poor fitness patterns in our lives by sculpting out a practical and workable plan for objective, measurable transformation. And the first step in our plan was the most demanding and challenging of the three stages or steps that I'm going to talk about here in this podcast. It was a, it was a not-so-simple process to submit our lives to the Lord while holding each other accountable. Repentance will determine the quality of your health. And maybe if you, if you only take one thing away from this podcast, let it be that. Repentance will determine the quality of our health. If we do not get this first step right, we will not reach our goals. Genuine repentance is not primarily about a plan, but primarily about our hearts. There are thousands of weight loss plans in the marketplace. I have tried half of them, I think. The cultural gurus give us their ideas, but there is only one way to repent. It is a gift from God, as Paul taught us in 2 Timothy. I have tried different programs offered by health advocates, 
And I'm not, not, again, I'm not knocking them. I'm not at all. Most of them work to some degree, but none of them actually hit the actual target because all of them were various forms of behavioral modification. Those plans give you a methodology that, that focuses on what you can see in the physical world, but they do not zero in on what you cannot see, which is in our hearts the spiritual person. We are a dichotomy, body and soul, and those two things are interrelated to make one person. And though there are practical necessities to losing weight, internal transformation is more critical. I will not share this passage with you because I'm sure you are familiar with it, but if not, I would ask you to jot down Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22, 23, 24. You know it so well. Put off, renew the mind, put on. Those are three essentials to the transformation process, and we cannot forget the renewal of the mind, which is right in the middle. If we put off and stop eating and put on, start eating well, and we have not renewed our minds, then we're going to have a problem. And so putting off bad food and putting on better food, it does not change what is wrong within us, spiritually speaking. Therefore, our goals must be more than trying to look good on the outside. People who do that, by the way, they really do have an internal problem, a spiritual problem, because they more than likely are reputational conscious. They're more than likely image conscious, uh, more than likely have been indoctrinated by self-esteem, and they really just want to look good on the outside. This is why many people have facelifts and all the uh, dye in our hair, and Botox and, and all of that. We're making a behavioral adjustment on the outside. We must perceive and work on what the Lord values, God knows, and treasures our hearts. Our primary goal must be to, mo to, to our primary goal must be more about what the Lord wants, sees, loves, treasures than cultural expectations or our preferred body image. We're on the right path if we want to begin in our hearts, which begs the bigger question. Repent of what? What are those things, those hidden idolatries? And so thinking about our souls brings us to the most crucial question within the repentance construct. What are the hidden idolatries of the heart? Now, when I thought about these things, what I did and I suggest this for you as I begin to write down those idolatries that tempt me to stay the way that I am. And so I'm going to share with you a list and sadly and regrettably and even maybe shamefully only a partial list as I took these things what I'm sharing with you to the Lord and I said help me to see what I cannot see help me to perceive what you perceive help me to know what you know so that I can begin making these internal heart transformations as I'm going to share with you this list though not exhaustive but it will be helpful enough to bring it was helpful enough to bring me to the place where I, I really just had to decide if I would live a life in a self-imposed delusional stupor full of misdirections and rationalizations, or will I honestly cry out to the Lord? And so as I begin to examine my hidden idolatries, here's my short list. These are the things that I began to discover about me that were operating inside of me, kind of like a cancer that you did not know about. Comfort, anxiety, fear, self-reliance. I'm going to detail these out in just a moment. Deceit, lack of self-control. Worry, arrogance, unbelief, lack of sympathy. Discouragement, spiritual blindness. Self-righteous, lazy, and hypocrisy. Those were some of the hidden idolatries that began to come out as I, as I really confronted myself before the Lord. In Psalm 51.10, David cried out, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And that is key, and it must be operative in our hearts if we're serious about change. And so all of those hidden idolatries that I just listed for you, working together, conspiring together in my heart for evil, as a sinful constellation that kept me in bondage to poor health, Rather than tackling them all at once, I, I commenced with one. Again, like debt reduction. Just don't go after all of your debt at one time. Go after one and build momentum. And so what I did from that list that I just shared with you is I chose 
hypocrisy first as it seemed a good starting point to begin the change process. It, and it, this is how I thought about it. It is hypocritical for me to counsel, to disciple, to train, to teach other people how to gain victory in any area of their lives when I'm not trying to secure victory in a particular area of my life. Now, I am not suggesting here that you have to have perfection in any area of your life. What you're looking for is which way are you leaning? Are you leaning toward striving toward Christ or are you you're not. You're going in the other direction or you're not trying at all. And so it's not the perfection of, of anything that you're working on, but the presence of. And so I had to be actively engaging. I don't want some of you to heap, heap unnecessary guilt on yourself because maybe you're not in the healthy state that you want. But what are you looking for here is the motive of your heart. Are you truly, genuinely trying not have you come to a perfected end? And that is what I had to challenge myself with that there is a, a level of hypocrisy here because how can I go and teach others to do X, Y, Z and be a disciple maker to train mastermind students when I'm not at least actively engaging some of the things in my life in this podcast I'm talking about health related issues. And so in my case, it was poor health choices which manifested primarily in three ways. One, overeating. Two, eating the wrong foods. And three, not exercising. Hypocrisy is a form of rationalization that stratifies sin by saying my sin is not as bad as your sin, even though the consequences of sin can be different. We know that, but we should also know that it is intellectually dishonest to think that my sin is of lesser importance to the Lord. Any sin is enough for Christ to die on the cross. And so I needed to address my heart sufficiently before engaging the gay guy, the angry guy, the addicted guy, the adulterer, or the victim-centered spouse. So I asked the Lord to search my heart, which meant it was time for me to be honest with God, to be honest with myself, and to be honest with others. Taking the log, extracting the log from my eye first is a better move than intellectually dishonest, spiritualized acrobatics that makes me feel superior to others. And so I could, not know, I could no longer ignore how my poor health choices and lack of exercise were feeding my idolatries, a process that led to another question. When would I indeed come to the end of myself regarding my health? Go back to the prodigal son when he came to his senses. No longer could I shuffle my sin around in my head while trying to make myself feel better about myself. It was time to take my soul to task, which meant examining how my heart sins led to behavioral sins. And so let me explain. Now, this is where I want to go through this list, and I, I want to talk about each one of these heart idolatries, and I want to make the connection between heart sins and, and that how it affected me behaviorally, but not just affected me behaviorally, but if we're not dealing with these things, whether it's health related or something else, it will create personal and relational frustration. You'll frustrate yourself and then you will frustrate your community because you're not living the way that you know you should live before the Lord. And so I wanna take each one of those things that I listed and just run through them and talk about how uh, they affected me. First one I mentioned was comfort. Food was a way for me to seek comfort when a better choice would be to find refuge in the Lord through prayer. You see the two options here. Take comfort through food, take comfort through God. I chose to take comfort through food. That is an idol. Number two, lack of self-control. A lack of resistance to food pointed to my unwillingness to appropriate God's grace regarding the fruit of the Spirit, specifically self-control. And so now I have, that's a double issue with God, seeking comfort through food rather than Him, exercising a lack of self-control rather than being managed by the Spirit. There is a theological issue operating here. Number three, self-reliance, doing things my way, which those previous two things say. It was not relying on the Lord, which spoke to an underlying attitude toward God. I can do what I want to do. I do not need you because I am self-sufficient. Number four, fear. 
Always attached to self-reliance is fear. I am afraid, therefore I need to take control of the situation. And so when things were not going my way, I was afraid. It tempted me to seize control, comfort of the situation through independent means rather than relying on the Lord, self-reliance. Number five, anxiety. Similar to fear was anxiety. It manifested as stress. When I became anxious, I ran for comfort through food. Number six is worry. Similar to fear, anxiety was worrying. It manifested by overthinking about a problem rather than trusting the Lord. Again, all this is leading to a theological issue, as you, as you can see. Discouragement, number seven, as you can see, there was an interconnectedness within my sin constellation. Multiple sin patterns intersected and interacted and collided with each other. It was adversarial. It was a war within. It was no wonder I became discouraged and sought comfort through eating. Number eight, self-righteousness. At the core of my idol factory was self-righteousness, a greater than, better than attitude. I'm trusting myself rather than the Lord. I feel superior. I can do it my way. That's an that's a element of self-righteousness. The Lord prefers the weak, not those so arrogant that they will not humble themselves before the Lord. Christ came for the broken, not those who pretend to be strong by seeking self-reliant means to, to keep up pretenses. And then there was arrogance. Arrogance? See self-reliance. <laughs> I, have, I have written here, in this article. You can see that I am in a nasty sin cycle like bumper cards, all these idolatries in the heart just going around and around and then colliding with each other at, at different moments. And then there's spiritual blindness, not biblically responding to my sin list spoke to my spiritual blindness. Now this is a person who's going to go from dull to heart as far as their conscience is concerned. Lack of sympathy. Jesus faced temptation in every way like us, which enabled him to be a sympathizing Savior. The more I engage my struggles, the more I can sympathize with other strugglers, even though their struggles may differ from mine. It does create a, 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 a sympathetic heart. Laziness, not willing to step up to the plate and, and do something about my health issues. Deceit, in addition to spiritual blindness, I was unwilling to be honest about what I perceived in my heart. Hypocrisy, see the entire sin list that I mentioned to you. And then finally, as I've been alluding to throughout, unbelief, not trusting the Lord. The most significant culprit of them all was my weak faith in the Lord. And so owning these moving parts in my heart was enough to motivate me to do something. Here's the question, what about you? Though your sin list may be different from mine, you must deal with the ruling motives of your heart because whatever they are, ruling motives of the heart will rule you. If you're willing to take your soul to task by being painfully honest with yourself and God, you can move on to the next step to better help. But first, I want you to answer these three questions. Number one, will you do it your way or God's way? Number two, Will you repent at the heart level, which releases you to make a practical plan for measurable change? And then number three, will you trust the Lord in word only, or will you trust him enough to change authentically? And so step one in this article that I have here is titled, A Practical Three-Step Plan to Lose Weight. You can read the article, you can watch the article, and of course, by podcast, you can listen. And so that's step one. Here's step two. I began to let my family know what was going on in my life, and I kept them informed of my progress. I did not wait for them to ask me. It would help if you held your team, your tribe, accountable for holding you accountable. And this is an important thing to think about. Too often a person blames friends for not being effective accountability partners. And there may be some truth to that. Many times there is. But here's the greater truth. It should not stop you from leading them by being honest, transparent, forthright about what God is doing in your life. Nobody but the Lord will love you the way that you need to be loved. People will not love you the way that you need to be loved, and they will fail you at times. Therefore, it is imperative 
If you want an accountability partner, then you need to lead others in how to love you well. Be their example. You lead them. Don't say, I have an accountability partner, and just sit back passively waiting for someone to hold you accountable. They won't, or they will start, but they will not finish. Teach them how to care for you. Lead them. And so number two, step number two, step number one is repentance. Step number two is begin to let people know. When you let people know about what's going on in your life, it does ratchet up the accountability just by letting them know. And then when you lead them and holding you accountable, then that takes it, takes it to a whole nother level where you're really in a good spot for transformation to happen. And then step number three, determine what you will eat. Now, in this step, you will have to insert your own personal, doable, practical plan. There is a way and there is the way. And I've just been talking about our way, a way. You will have to insert your own personal, doable, practical plan. A customized plan means you have to do your research and write out a proper program for you. The method you decide to implement will be the core of your program. And if you follow these steps of repentance and then informing your tribe about what's going on and holding them accountable, and then you lay out your plan. You, your community, must determine what kinds and how much of what types of food that you will eat. Better health happens in a community. Only you, the Lord, your friends, your medical community can speak to this critical step. And the hardest part is what you're doing now, assuming that you're doing it and that is being honest about your authentic self. Now, please understand that we do not provide medical advice. And so before you do anything that alters your health, you must check with your trusted medical community to gain their perspectives, their advice, and recommended paths forward. And so as I wrap up, I want to ask a few questions. Will you be honest with yourself? What would this type of honesty look like for you and among your friends? Number two, will you be honest with the Lord? As you do business with the Lord, what would honesty do? What would it look like for him? What would it reveal? What deceptions would be uncovered? Number three, will you be honest with others? Bringing your life to the light is one of the most transforming things you can do. And so what is your specific plan? If being overweight is a sin pattern in your life, the strategies to overcome this problem are no different from any other sin. The temptation is to isolate and to ignore and to justify what we do. If the Lord has spoken to you, gather your team of friends and get to work. Now, I want to give you six keys that will help you in this process. One, very practical, eat healthily. Eat well. Eat the right kinds of food for you. Number two, exercise regularly. Figure out what you can and cannot do and what you should do. Uh, you can go to the YMCA. Uh, you can get someone to help you and to coach you, teach you the machines and how to do exercise properly. And of course, there's a zillion pieces of information on the internet as well. Eat healthily, exercise regularly, no smoking, moderate to no alcohol, maintain proper weight. And then uh, number six, the grace of God. God will bless you for your humility. And so eat healthily and exercise with gratitude, knowing that there is coming a day when these privileges of grace, of eating healthily and exercise, being mobile and moving about, these privileges of grace may not be ours. I don't want to look back when I am 75 years old, regretting how I did not take advantage of the grace given to me because of my unwillingness to repent. There's so many times in our lives, and maybe you've had this experience too, definitely in mine, where I, I got out into the future and I look back and I just, oh, I wish I had. You don't have to do that with this. You don't have to get to the future and look back and regret with remorse and, and thinking, this is what I should, this is what I should have done. So in addition to that, I want to remember the next time I come alongside a friend struggling with a particular sin realizing how difficult it is for me to apply the gospel to this one area practically. We're fellow strugglers who need each other in this great adventure with the Lord. And so as you try to tackle your 
most tempting problem, whatever, and it may not be, it may not be what I'm talking about here, but in that context, it doesn't matter when you try to conquer your most difficult foe. It should create humility to other people who have struggles that aren't like yours. The temptation is is to, to think about the things that we have gained victory over and then map that over other people who are struggling and cannot get a grip on the things that you have gained victory over. We don't want to be those people. And so as you work on your most difficult challenge, whether it's weight loss or something else, well, let that let God work in your heart so that we don't create that superior attitude to where we look down on others, which can, which can look like uncharitable judging or even becoming angry with them because they haven't mastered what you mastered. You're listening to the article, A Practical Three-Step Plan to Lose Weight. I trust that this has benefited you. And if you want to talk to us, we do have community forums where we interact with people. We're not just a monologue ministry. We're also dialogue. And so if we can help you with what you have just heard or watched, then please let us know. If you have something else on your mind, we would love to talk about that as well. Please write a review for uh, this resource here and share it with others.